Yeah, of course it did. Okay, there we go. Now people on the other platform should be able to hear me. All right. Make sure everybody can still hear me. Yes, there is a talk today. There, CB Red. We're going to give everybody just a couple more minutes to hop on in on all platforms. Just giving everybody just a few more, a couple more minutes. So, while we wait, what is everybody smoking on? What is everybody token on? What is everybody staying lifted on? At the beginning of my shows, I like to ask this question because it is fun to see what people's answers are. Dabs of wedding pie. Sounds amazing. Hello, everybody from Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. White runts. Ooh, that's an interesting sounding one. White widow, always a classic. Mango haze, Mr. Nice. Ooh. High octane. Now that one sounds like it'll knock you on your ass. Tico Glue Ball. Ah, another interesting sounding one. Man, all these people doing dabs, you know. You know the old saying, a dab will do ya. All right, so we're getting quite a few people in now. Uh, so I think it should be a good time to start. So how, hopefully everybody is having a wonderful morning. If you are, uh, I'm glad to hear it. As where myself, I am, I just got back from church. Great sermon. And I'm ready to rock and roll. Get this information out to you guys so that you guys hopefully can help keep your pests out of your tents or out of your garden if you are gardening. So, on the agenda today, obviously we will have the introduction. I'm going to go over most of your common indoor uh, insect pests. I'm not going to say pest pests because I'm focusing more on the insect side of things. There are other pests that I can not and will eventually talk about. I will be talking about common outdoor insect pests. Uh, to lead into pest management, I will be going over common beneficial insects. Yes, you can use insects to kill other insects. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds weird, but trust me, I do it every day and it is amazing. I'm going to go over good integrated pest management. I'm going to go over chemical insecticides that kill, organic insecticides that kill, then we'll go over the summary. So when it comes to growing any kind of plant, you need to know what to look for when it comes to bugs eating your crops. It is one of the most annoying things that you can ever have is having these little pesky little bastards coming onto your plant and chewing your flowers or your, your leaves and jacking everything up. So we will go through different common insects that are pests, insects that will help you out good IPM to put into place and to prevent an outbreak from originally happening. Now an IPM is usually what you use to prevent an outbreak from happening, but an IPM can also be used to combat an outbreak that you are currently having. Some of the uh, seven of the most common, these are the seven most common that most people will see inside their tents are going to be spider mites, 
mealybugs, fungus gnats, aphids, white flies, leaf miners, and thrips. I'm pretty sure everybody's heard these names before, and I'm sure everybody's had an issue with them at one point in time. Spider mites. Spider mites are one of the most common pests inside the insect family. There are two main kinds that you will see primarily in indoor grows, which are going to be your two-spotted spider mites or your russet spider mites. They're going to be really bright red in color or orange in color, like if you see in this picture. They're kind of an orangish color. They like to spin their webs inside the leaves because it's close to their food. That's another way to identify them is their webbing on the leaves. There are multiple ways, uh, going over multiple ways of identifying them. Uh, like I was saying, the signature webbing. Uh, if you look at the leaves, you'll see like spottiness on the leaves starting to form, especially if you start seeing white spots, that's their eggs. If you start seeing white uh, snow spots, like it looks like it's snowed on your plants, it, it, it's their eggs. You want to look under the leaves, you want to look over the leaves, because these pests will replicate like crazy, and it can and will happen overnight as well. So when you're looking for these pests, those are what you're mainly looking for. Towards the end is where I'm going to go over how to get rid of them. Your mealybugs, these things are just, they're more of an annoyance than anything. They, they will damage your plant, but they're slow at doing it. These guys, what they do is they tend to suck sap from the plants and the leaves, and they excrete what's called honeydew. And when they excrete honeydew, they will also start attracting ants. Now, there are very few species of ants that will actually harm your plant because they'll start eating at your roots. But those are the ants that these bugs attract are those non-beneficial ants that will actually start attacking the roots they'll start eating the leaves and everything else because a cannabis plant produces really sweet leaves they really really do they're high in con high they have a high content of sugar so they attract mealybugs the mealybugs will attract the ants the ants will start eating your roots and it's they just create a big old mess that's why they're such a a, a pain in the butt to deal with but if you catch them soon enough, especially if they're your indoors, you won't have to worry too much about the ants. But you will have to worry about them sucking on the sap. And if you take a look at the mealybugs, they look like they have this white powder on their their backs. And that stuff just gets everywhere. And it's it, they're just like I said, they're just a pain in the butt to take care of. But these are one of the easier ones to take care of. You can literally take a Q-tip with rubbing alcohol and take care of them. They're, they're not a rapidly producing pest. They're not a rapidly moving pest. And they're just more of a nuisance than anything. But they can and will destroy your plant by sucking sap out of them. These pests, these won't necessarily hurt your plant unless you do, unless you have an absolutely overabundance breakout of fungus gnats. Then they will start harming your plants, but fungus gnats, they're more of a, a household annoyance than anything because they fly in your face, they fly all over the place, they're a pain in the butt to get rid of. Uh the the they're they're just a pain in the butt all around. Um so if you get them, they they won't necessarily destroy your plant, but they can if there's an abundance of them. Aphids now the these creatures, oh my gosh, these guys are a pain. They they breed quick, they reproduce quick. They are they they will decimate a plant f almost overnight. And like the mealybugs, they will secrete honeydew as well, which will attract not only more aphids but more ants, more of the mealybugs. It's it, it, they they're a horrible horrible insect to deal with so if you see them you want to implement an ipm or you want to implement your uh way of getting rid of them as quickly as possible white flies are the next one to um go over these guys these guys will produce 
they're they're one of the fastest producers out of all these pests. They're one of the fastest producers. As you can see uh, on the picture, you'll see all these tiny yellow dots. That's their eggs. And a female can lay upwards of 500 eggs in one sitting. So they reproduce quick. They suck sa the the larva sucks sap from the leaves. The adult flies will suck from the flowers, and they will destroy a plant really, really fast. I mean, insanely fast. They're hard to get rid of, and if you get them, you you want you want to take care of them as quickly as possible. Leaf miners. These guys. If you see these guys, especially if you see a live one in a leaf, pick that leaf off and burn it. <laughs> Literally, just you, you, you might as well burn it because these guys, what they do is they burrow in between the leaf membrane and they start literally eating the leaf from the inside outward. They eat the, the sugar, they eat the leaf material, and they leave these little white trails in the leaf. And that's how you can tell that you have them, is you start seeing these little, like, trails on your leaves, and it looks completely unnatural. If you see that, you have leaf miners. If you have these, but again, implement your IPM. Do whatever you need to do to get rid of them because these things are another one that will decimate a plant fairly quick. So hopefully hopefully you guys will never encounter these guys. These guys are such a pain in the ass too. Thrips. Uh, thrips are an interesting one because you can get thrips confused with a beneficial insect known as springtails. Thrips and springtails, from afar, they look very similar. They bounce, they jump. But the biggest thing that you'll notice with the thrips is they leave this kind of silvery film on your leaves. So if you start to see kind of a silvery th film or what looks like fish scales on your leaves, you know you have leaf miners. So you're going to want to implement an IPM. You're going to want to implement, you know, making sure you have, an, if you're doing, depending on if you're going organic or if you're using chemicals, you want to, you want to implement the right IPM for these guys. These guys tend to have a more specific way of getting rid of them because they're that big of a pain in the butt because they not only breed on top of the leaves, but they also breed in the soil as well. Now, the three common outdoor insect pests are also indoor. They're not just outdoor, but these are more commonly found outdoors in your garden than most of the other ones. And they're a lot easier to see with the naked eye as well. These are your caterpillars, your leaf-footed bugs, or leaf bugs is also what they're known as, or your cabbage worms. Oops. Oops. Okay, I just didn't switch the picture. Whoops. Uh, so caterpillars. There's there there's something you have to remember about caterpillars. Caterpillars, especially when they evolve into butterflies or moths, they are actually a huge benefit to the environment, to the ecosystem. So you don't want to just kill every single caterpillar off. When it comes to caterpillars... My recommendation is if you have an overabundance, obviously yes. If they become a pest, obviously yes. Try to destroy them. But if you're only seeing one or two, don't don't kill it. Instead, release it to a different part of the garden. Or plant what they call trap crops. Caterpillars are attracted to milkweed. So you can plant milkweed on the border of your house and it'll keep the caterpillars away. And it'll keep them happy won't have to worry about them turning into a pest. But they are a pest to the cannabis cultivation industry because they eat leaves. They they eat plants. That's how they survive. But it's their their adult version, their their evolved version that are beneficial to the environment because butterflies they they suck on the sap of other flowers. 
or the nectar, let me let me correct myself. They suck on the nectar of other flowers. And then they also help flowers reproduce by spreading pollen. They're just like a they're they're just as important as bees. They just they they evolve differently. That that's the only difference. So when you see caterpillars, especially if it's you know like your your caterpillar that actually turns into like the monarch butterfly or something like that, where you know that caterpillar is going to be a benefit to the environment when they evolve and hatch out of their pupae stage. I I would just move them. I would pick them up, move them, and leave them be. They're 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 not a type of pest that is going to decimate a crop like you would see with other types of bugs. Leaf footed bugs or leaf bugs, these are these are common all over the world, all over the United States, all over Europe, Asia, they're everywhere. These guys seem harmless. But what they do is they will actually dig holes into branches, into stems, and they they have a really long tongue to suck sap out of the branches, leaves, and stems. And that's how these guys are a pest. Uh, they're they're not an overabundance. They're not a hard pest to get rid of. They're not a hard pest to deter. But if you do see them, definitely take them off your plants. Definitely get rid of them. These aren't like the caterpillar. Definitely kill them. Get rid of them. And definitely try to use an IPM that deters these guys. Whether it's outside or inside. I would, I would definitely suggest using an IPM that will deter these guys. And the IPM you use for other insects, like your spider mites, your mealybugs and whatnot, will also deter leaf-footed bugs as well. Cabbage worms, cabbage worms, they kill them. If you see one of these guys, get rid of them. If you look at the picture to the right, this is what a typical cabbage worm looks like. They're real small, they're... They they look like a mixture between literally a uh they look like a mixture between a caterpillar and a worm. They're real fuzzy and they they do a lot of damage fairly quick. One worm can do a lot of damage fairly fairly quick. They they take chunks out of leaves. As you can see on the picture, just this one caterpillar did all this damage. And that was literally within just a few hours of this cabbage worm being on this leaf. So they have a vivacious appetite. They have, they're, they're extremely destructive and it's, they're a pain in the ass if you have them. So if you see them, get rid of them. Definitely get rid of them. So these are a lot of the pests that you will come across when it comes to indoor grows as well as when it comes across outdoor grows. All these pests are seen indoors, outdoors. One is primarily more indoors. One is primarily more outdoors. But you will see them both indoors and outdoors. This is why you want to have a good IPM or integrated pest management system put into place. It's because when you have an, a, a good IPM put into place, you're, you're not going to have to worry so much. And if you do see a pest on your plants, you have a good IPM put into place. It makes it a lot easier to prevent that pest from turning into an outbreak of pests. So to get started on a good IPM, I'm going to kind of get started on the organic side of things. So before I get started in that, I'm actually going to start taking questions. I know I've kind of sped through a lot of these pests but the reason being is because i have a lot to get through on these slot uh, on this subject so i uh the first half of it i wanted to give you guys the knowledge of being able to at least identify these pests so that if you see them you could be like okay there's something here and I may need to get rid of them, so let me figure out what I need to do. Let me see what I have around, or let me see 
what I can get to get rid of these pests if they are truly pests. So now I'm just going to take questions starting off with Discord. Uh, so for Discord, let's see if I have any questions. All right. Uh, how likely are you to getting indoor pests? That is, uh, that's actually a really, really great question. Uh, that is something that a lot of first time growers ask. And I think a lot of first time growers tend to stay away from growing is because of this question is how do you, people complain about indoor pests all the time, but believe it or not, it, it's, it's not hard to prevent yourself from getting indoor pests. The way you get the, the best way to, for me to answer this question is by how do you get your pests in your tent in the first place? The most common way of getting indoor pests is when you go outside and you're working on an outside garden or, you know, you go on a, a, a even going on a hike, you know, you, you go out and you, you brush up against some grass, you brush up against some bushes or whatever and a mealy bug gets on your pants or some spider mites get on your clothing you get home and instead of waiting a good couple hours before going into your tent you go straight from outside to straight into your tent and that's how you get your pests so the 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 first thing of implementing a good ipm is just making sure if you go outside just make sure either you change your clothes, have a, a extra pair of clothes ready uh, for you to change into, and then take your dirty clothes and throw them straight into the laundry basket. Or just when when you're done doing whatever you're doing outside, just you know wait a good couple hours before you check on your plants. When you do that, it it, it prevents whatever you're you're taking from the outside and bring it into your tent. So hopefully that's a good answer to that question for you. Uh, let's see. Is there any more questions from Discord? Uh, got fungus gnats. First time organic. Okay. Uh, so for fungus gnats, uh, I will actually be going over this. Uh, with your IPM, but fungus gnats, seems how they're actually one of the, the weaker pests and one of the easier pests to get rid of, but one of the harder pests at the same time. Uh, I'll give it to you uh, before I go over it. And that's, I use mosquito bits. What I'll do is I'll make a, uh, I'll sprinkle mosquito bits over the top of my soil. And then I'll make a mosquito bit tea where you take mosquito bits and you let it soak in water for a good two, three hours. And then you dilute it uh one part per one 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 part per ten parts of water and then you just do a a light foliar or not foliar spray a light spray on top of the soil get that that top inch of soil wet with the uh mosquito bits or that mosquito bit tea that you made and it, it'll actually get rid of a majority of the fungus gnats fairly quick and then another great way to take care of them is just that let that first top inch of soil dry out for a good week people who do bottom water feeding or bottom watering have a little bit easier time doing that than those of us who do top watering but if you let that top inch of soil dry out completely for a good week you stand a better chance of drying out those eggs and those larvae and it prevents them from turning into adults, which lays more eggs. Uh, I will, uh, Yoda, I will actually be going over getting beneficial bugs and where to get them uh, in a little bit. That is actually a part of the IPM portion of the session. And now going to uh, YouTube and Facebook. Going to check to see if there's any questions here real quick. Uh, Timothy, yes, uh, I do want to point that out as well. We do support vet codes. We support our veterans exponentially. We love our veterans. So if you are a veteran, uh, shout out to you guys. 
And I give my deepest condolences and deepest thanks as well. All right, let's see any other questions. Okay, uh, we grow together. Thank you for that. Uh, he's saying that the white OG strain, he's very happy with. So awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, cabbage worms are jerks. Absolutely. Does neem oil work? Okay. So I'm going to create a controversy here with neem oil. I do not use neem oil. I am officially against neem oil for the time being, and there's a reason behind that. Neem oil works. It, it does a very great job. But here's the thing is they, uh, there's a few universities that are doing studies on neem oil. <clears throat> now, neem oil is ingestible to an extent, but you can't actually poison yourself with neem oil. But here, here's one thing that they're starting to study, and it's the, these studies are not finished yet, and that's why I've officially stayed away from neem oil. Neem oil is has a possible tie to a a syndrome where if you smoke too much cannabis, you develop the syndrome. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it, it makes it to where if you ingest THC, you get violently sick. It won't kill you. It won't hurt you. It just makes you sick, really, really sick. And it's real hard to get past or get over having that cannabis syndrome. And there, there's a possible tie between neem oil and uh, smoking cannabis. So until those studies are finished, I, I won't fully recommend neem oil. What I would actually recommend are other products that utilize bacteria and fungus to deter and kill off non-beneficial insects. And that, that's what I would recommend. Especially if you're trying to keep it organic. Now, obviously, if you don't care about the organic side of things, uh, or if you're you're planning on using an insecticide anyway, just use an insecticide. Just make sure you don't spray your, your flowers with it. And make sure you follow the directions on how often you should spray and how long you should spray if or before you harvest that, that plant. Um, whoever is monitoring Facebook, can somebody ban Triadi Saperta for advertisement? I'm sorry, if you come onto my show and you advertise like that, you will be immediately banned, and I have no problem saying that out loud. I find it extremely disrespectful and extremely rude. Now, uh, to continue on, uh, sorry about that, people. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, the organic side of things for IPM. Uh, and the way I'm going to start out with that is by giving you guys information on what we call beneficial insects. So beneficial insects are insects that don't attack your plant. They don't attack your roots. Uh, they will either they will do one of two things. They will either eat organic material that is starting to break down so things like root rot uh there are insects like springtails that are beneficial to root rot they will go in there that, uh, because they don't have stomachs they have gizzards they can only eat things that are decaying so they're not going to eat your plant what they will do though is those roots that are rotting They'll eat those. So that's that's one half of a beneficial of the beneficial insects. The other half of beneficial insects are insects that actually attack and eat the non-beneficial insects. And I'll go, those are what I'm going to go over now. So the first one that are the list that we're going to go over are your most common, which are ladybugs. Everybody knows about ladybugs. Ladybugs are an amazing IPM. And if there's a uh, an actual group that I belong to that we try to make sure we keep the population of bees, ladybugs, and other certain types of insects, 
up in the environment because they are very, very beneficial to the environment, and ladybugs is one of those those insects. You have your soldier beetle, assassin bug, rove beetle, pirate bug, your mantises or praying mantises, and your predatory mites. Yes, you can use mites to fight off mites. This is what your typical ladybug is. Not to be confused with your Asian ladybugs. La Asian ladybugs are considered a pest. The biggest way you can tell the difference between a regular ladybug and an Asian ladybug is the Asian ladybugs have more of an orange shell as opposed to a red shell. Now, ladybugs, what these guys do is they are an aphid decimator. You release ladybugs near aphids, anywhere near aphids, and you release 100 ladybugs, you can say goodbye to those aphids. They will decimate them literally overnight. And ladybugs are really, really smart. They won't kill every single aphid off or every single spider mite off. What they will do is they will leave, you know, one or two, just enough to, to, to have that constant supply of food. So th these guys aren't dumb. They, they will leave a small amount of non-beneficial insects for them to eat, to give to their larva. And the adults will actually fly off and find food elsewhere, making your pot a permanent home for the larva to continue eating those non-beneficial insects. And let me tell you, these these guys, from the moment they hatch from their eggs all the way up to their last day of life, these guys don't stop eating. And it is amazing to watch them. They will pick an aphid off, and you will sit there and watch them, and they will eat that aphid, no problem. They're not scared of you. As long as they got food in their mouth, they're happy, they're content. The next one we're going to go over is the soldier beetle. These guys are primarily known for feeding on aphids and soft body insects uh they will they can and will attack and eat beneficial insects as well but they don't prefer those like they would a insect that is trying to eat your plants uh they feed and if they they don't have insects to eat on what they will do is they will feed off of the pollen of milkweed, waiting for their prey. That's uh, next to eating other insects. Pollen from milkweed or nectar from milkweed is their next favorite meal. So if you decide to have these in your tent, have a have a small milkweed kind of in the background to to let these guys you know go to and from and. You'll keep them around for ever, and they they will keep your pests the the pests down in your pots very effectively, very very effectively. These guys uh, want the only reason why you don't want them when you already have a breakout is because they're harder to establish. These these guys aren't easy to establish. You you want to establish these guys when you don't have a breakout, and that's going to be the same with some of your other beneficial insects. Uh, this is this is another one you want to try to implement before you have an outbreak, and that's the assassin bug. These guys are great. They're another one with a vivacious appetite, and they are really good at their job. They do really great, especially when it comes to spider mites, thrips, and aphids. Those are their three favorite meals, are spider mites, drips, and aphids. One thing about these guys is when you release them, leave them alone. Don't try to handle them. Don't try to pick them up because their bite hurts like a son of a bitch. Because their bites aren't like a regular bite. They are, their, bite their, their mouths are a needle, and they will, in, they will stick you with that, that mouth of theirs, and it hurts. Now, there is only one form of assassin bug that is technically uh, 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 bad for a human being, and those are the love bugs. They're called love bugs. And they're a form of assassin bug, and they're parasitic, and that's why they're dangerous to humans. But your chances of coming across a love bug are 
you have a better chance of winning the lottery, really, to be honest with you. But these guys, the this type of assassin bug right here, they're they're very effective at what they do. They're very effective at keeping pests down, and they will also help keep your your tent clean. Really, to be honest with you, because they 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 will go out. Uh, search your tent, and if they find anything in your tent, they'll go out and find it and eat it. So they're they're very good at what they do. They're they're very beneficial to have in your soil, really. Rove beetles are another fascinating creature, another fascinating IPM to put into your soil, because these guys do two things. They do both sides of beneficial insects. They are great hunters. They are constantly on the move, non-stop. They are always looking for something to eat. They are always looking for something to do. They burrow down into the soil. They are always at the top of the soil. They'll climb your plant. They'll look for anything and everything to eat. But they will not touch your plant. They will not touch your roots. They, they primarily like insects or decaying matter. And that's the other part that these these guys play uh, play a role in is they will actually eat decaying matter so if you have root rot these guys will actually go in there and eat the root rot as well as other non-beneficial insects so they, these guys are great to have in your soil uh just to have to keep as an ipm as well as a great way to prevent root rot and these guys don't bite they they look menacing but really they're not they uh i've had hundreds of them crawling on my hand and that they clean your hand off if you have anything on your hand they'll clean your hand off and then they'll go right back into the soil and like nothing ever happened pirate bug these guys are another one that when you release them leave them alone <laughs> they, they they their bite is another one that hurts like a son of a bitch uh but these guys are absolutely insane. They have been known to take prey down. That is 15 times their size. Even as a larva, they will take down prey 15 times its own size. So these guys, they they do not eat plants. They do not eat plant matter. They are specific. They eat specifically insects. Uh, so they are so good that that farmers who do grain farms they will release them into their grain or into their silos and let them be they 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 will let them be inside their grain because they'll take down your mealy worms they will take down your horn worms they will take down your potato bugs they will take i mean they eat anything and everything and it doesn't matter how big they are they will take them down and they will eat them and if you take a look at the their their mouths just like the assassin bug, their mouths are like spears. They're like needles. And they pierce their, their prey and they eat them from the inside out. Uh, their favorite foods are moths and their worms. That's their all-time favorite foods. So if you see like your your horned worm or your uh, your uh, potato bug or something like that, release these guys. You won't have a problem anymore. These guys just love them. Next one we're going to go over is mantises, praying mantises. Now, with these guys, there is one big thing you have to remember if you're going to get a praying mantis to uh, have as part of your IPM. And that's to make sure you get together with your wildlife and make sure which you buy a praying mantis that is not considered a pest to your environment because there are some mantises that will take over and decimate an area with other insects and it'll throw the ecosystem out of balance i know it's weird to hear that insects can throw an ecosystem out of balance but it really can so you want to make sure the biggest thing you want to make sure with mantises is that you're getting proper mantises that are made for your environment a lot of people that i know that use these guys what they will actually do is they will actually go out to a wooded area near them and find a praying mantis that is out in the woods near them that way they know 
that they're getting ones that are not going to uh, affect the environment immediately around them. They'll put them in their tent, let them do their job, and then when they're done doing their job, release them back into the wild. These guys have a vivacious appetite, and they don't require any maintenance whatsoever. If they're thirsty, one thing that's really cool to watch what these guys do is when they're thirsty, they will actually go up to your trichome, take a head of a trichome, suck on that head of the trichome, and they're good for a good couple weeks. It's really cool to watch. And they don't hurt your plant at all. Even if, even when they do take that one little trichome, it ain't going to hurt your plant none. But they're real great, especially when it comes to thrips, worms, bites. You know, they're, they're real great and real effective at, at taking care of them. And if you can get more than one in your tent, that that's even better. Just make sure you're not putting a male in with a female because she'll bite his head off after they mate. And the final thing I wanted to talk about is predatory mites. These guys are amazing. I have the every time I build a new pot, I always buy a set of predatory mites. And there is so many different forms of predatory mites that you can use. Some are specialized, some are generalized. Me, I buy a a pack of mites that are both specialized and generalized spy, uh, predatory mites or spider mites that will attack, you know, your two-spotted spider mites, your russet mites, as well as any other type of pest that you have in your grow tent. Now, like some of you were asking before, is where do you get these? I buy mine online, and the two best places I go are Arborco Organics, which is... They, they sell both... Uh, Insects and pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides. And the other place that I get my insects from are, down, or not down to earth, uh, Nature's Good Guys. They sell nothing but insects. So you won't find, you know, insecticides, pesticides, fungicides. You'll just see insects on their, their website. But those are the two places I would recommend going. They have a wide array of insects that you can use for your grow tent, for your IPM. And they're really not that expensive expensive either. The only downside is you will have to pay for overnight shipping because the majority of those predatory insects, they tend to not like being inside the mail for too long. So a lot of them force you to pay the overnight shipping and handling. But, you know... For a good IPM, it's well worth it. Really, really well worth it. Now, the final two things I'm going to go over are chemicals and organics that kill insects. And then I will be touching, finally touching on implementing a good IPM. So... There are many great chemicals that will kill and decimate an outbreak. You have your insecticides, you have your fungicides, and you have your pesticides. The biggest thing you have to worry about chemicals are you will have to remember if you feel the need to go this route, you're going to kill off any organic. If, you, if you're doing organics, these type of chemicals will kill your organics. It is, they're a blanket to destroying insects and destroying pests. There, very few of them are detailed to a specific type of outbreak. Another thing you have to think about is your environment. Certain insecticides can actually hurt your environment, so do your research. Another thing you, you're going to have to worry about is never spray actual flowers. Do not spray chemicals on your flowers. You can hurt them. You can get yourself sick. You can get other people sick. So spray only green foliage, never the flower. And make sure you spray within the time period specified by that chemical so that 
that chemical is out of the plant system by the time you harvest that plant. Because there are certain insecticides that can and will stay in the plant for an extended period of time, and that's what they're made to do. There are certain insecticides that will stay in a plant for a month at a time. So if you're two, three weeks within harvest and you see those, those pests starting to show up, you don't want to use that insecticide that's going to stay inside that plant for a month. Otherwise, you're just going to extend that, that grow time or that flower time beyond where you're going to want to harvest. So that's another thing you're going to have to remember to read about and investigate before you do that, before you purchase that product and use that product. And the same does go with some organic insecticides as well. There are some organic insecticides you don't want to use before har uh, within a certain time frame of harvest as well. But those are fewer and far more far between than the chemical side because the organic side is usually made with or is almost all the time made with things that are naturally found in nature that won't harm nature and that tend to work alongside of nature as opposed to destroying that environment. And then, of course, your organic insecticides, like I was saying, are extreme, just as effective, sometimes if not more, or sometimes if not less, more effective than your their chemical counterparts. A majority of them contain bacteria-based media, or they're bacteria suspended in a liquid. And that's what helps prevent insects or kills the insects and prevents and kills outbreaks now when you're looking for organics here in america or here in the united states and canada we have a system called omri so if you take a look at this picture over to the right you'll see a stamp called omri there are other stamps of approval for organics and those are what you want to look for because they tend to have more of a stringent process to make sure it is truly organic. It's not going to harm the environment if disposed of. It's not going to harm, you know, the beneficial insects that you want to keep around. You know, it, they, they have a stringent process to say, okay, this is truly organic. Uh, there are some organic pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides that also use fungus that will also kill soft bodies or hard-bodied insects. There are some fungicides or insecticides that are made with a fungus that actually uh, turn insects into zombies, essentially, and it'll keep that insect alive long enough to, to spread that fungus, and it decimates those bad insects, those non-beneficial insects that you want to get rid of. So there's multiple forms of organic insecticides that you can look at. But again, you want you want to read the warning labels. You want to read how to apply these these insecticides and fungicides to your plant or to your soil. Just because they're safer doesn't mean it doesn't come with a caveat. It doesn't come with a warning label. And that's why I chose this picture is because it reiterates that you want to do your research you want to make sure what you're getting is what you want to get organics may be a little bit more expensive than the chemical side of things but if you're an organic grower that cost is going to outweigh the the or that benefit is going to far outweigh that cost so before we hit the summary uh i want to go over implementing a good IPM for your grow. <clears throat> I know I had it earlier in the 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 what we're going to talk about slides, but I wanted to actually save that for the end. And when you when, when if you're a new grower, you're just getting your tent set up, you're just getting your pot set up if you're doing a uh, hydroponic DWC system, if you're doing a auto pot system, or if you're doing soil and you're hand watering, you know, you want to have a good insect pest or uh, invasive pest management system set up. You want to have a system that is going to prevent your, 
these non-beneficial bugs from coming into your tent and destroying months and months of hard work because you don't want to be sitting there growing for six, eight, nine weeks. You have your plant in flower and you're just, you're excited. You're two weeks out from being able to harvest and suddenly you wake up one morning, look in your tent and you, your flowers are covered by nothing but webbing. Or you open up your tent and you look at your, your branch and you see little green bugs crawling up your stem. And you realize now you have aphids. So having a good IPM in place prevents that. And for those who are on the inorganic side of things or using liquid nutrients, for you guys, a good IPM would be, you know, spraying a, a certain insecticide, fungicide, and pesticide onto your plants and onto your medium on a weekly, monthly, or however long. You want to keep a, a good pattern up to keep, keep your pests away. Then if you do find that you have an outbreak of a specific pest, it won't having a good IPM in place will prevent that overnight decimation of your crop. So say you've been spraying your plant with a insect control for spider mite strips and uh whatever else, uh mealy bugs or something like that. You know and then you wake up one morning and you start seeing, but it, it, it's not an outbreak yet, but you're starting to see it. Now you can go, okay, I'm starting to see it. So let me get, let me spray either an extra time or let me get something else that, that I can add to my IPM that will get rid of them, that I can use for a short time, get rid of them. That way my current IPM can continue, continue on and keep those pests away. For those doing the organic side of things, you know, we, we have a little bit of a funner time with this. A good IPM for a lot of us who grow in soil is to get those bugs. You know, I build a pot. The second I build a pot, I, I've already ordered a set of predatory mites, a mix of predatory mites. I've already ordered a set of rove beetles. No, I, I, that, that's my IPM. I, I don't spray my plants with anything. And I, but I have rove beetles. I have predatory mites. I, I do have assassin bugs in my, uh, my tent. And then on top of that, I also, uh, I also use bacteria based foliar sprays. So when I make a compost tea, I'll add in a little bit of bacteria in there to help prevent prevent bugs from biting into my plants and it, it's very effective you know it, it changes the chemical it changes the chemical process of the plant so that when a mealy bug or a thrip or a spider mite comes onto that plant now it doesn't taste good to that bug so that the minute that bug bites into that plant that bug's gonna be like no nah, i'm out of here this this stuff tastes gross and then we also have tacked on to that we also have, like I was saying, that bacteria, bacteria inoculated foliar spray. So we can have a little bit more fun with our IPM if you're into bugs. But you want to have that in place, ultimately. You want to have a good IPM set into place. Get yourself onto a schedule to check to make sure that you, there's nothing bad in your tent. Especially if you're on the hydroponic side of things, I would definitely, you know, check or do a weekly spray of whatever you want to use for your IPM. I would also get yourself on a schedule to check your plants periodically, making sure that second part is actually for both organic and inorganic. You want to check your plants. You want to you want to look at your plants just like you're looking for nuts and nanners. You want to look for insects as well. You want to get into the habit of doing that. That is probably your biggest number one IPM that you can do is physically getting into your tent, 
looking over your plants. Take take. I know it'll take a good 10, 15 minutes, depending on how big your plant is. But you want to go in there. You want to look over your plant. You want to make sure that there isn't anything attacking your plant. Because all it takes is one insect to be in your plant. And it could wreak havoc literally overnight. So that that's the final thing I wanted to touch on when it came to your IPM insects and stuff like that. So going over for the summary... Hopefully, you all will never see these pests in your growth, but if you did, hopefully I gave you plenty of ammunition to get rid of them quickly and effectively. So, that is the Seedsman's Session. For those of you who are on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, if you have a Discord account and you, uh, you are a part of our channel, this is where I will actually go into Discord and do a drawing. I do a drawing every week for seeds. And uh, this is usually when I do it. So if you are part of our Discord, get ready, hop on in, get ready to for the drawing. And for those of you who are not a part of the Discord, let me get you the link real quick and post it so that you all can have it as well. All right, posting it now. There everybody goes. It's on YouTube. It should be posting on to Facebook. There it goes. So everybody that is on YouTube and Facebook, thank you for coming and thank you for joining in. Hopefully this was informative for you. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. And hopefully I gave you something to chew on and think about. For Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, hey, you all have a wonderful